Gary here from the Wildly Unexplained Podcast. And if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's actually the easiest way to make a podcast. Now, let me kind of explain. So one, it's free. You know, we haven't paid a single penny, you know, haven't had to pay anything to Anchor to create our podcast and to kind of capture, you know, what we've envisioned for this. There's actually creation tools that allow you to record and to edit your podcast anywhere you are, right from your phone or even your computer. Anchor will actually distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more of the top listening platforms. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a good podcast all in one place. So go download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome back, everyone, to episode four of the Wildly Unexplained podcast. I'm Gary. And I'm Danny. So we've actually, our Patreon's live, and if you'd like to support the podcast and promote future episodes with us, we're currently running a a subscriber special, and signups right now are $2.50. Patronage will give you access to our community Discord, where you can dust cases or future content with not only us, but other individuals much like yourselves. And without further ado... Let's hop right into episode number four. So today, Danny, we're going to cover Aaron Hedges, a 38-year-old hunter from Bozeman, Montana. Uh, He went elk hunting in the crazy mountains of Montana in early September with two buddies. So the three of them had planned out a week-long trip to the Cottonwood Lake Trailhead uh, on Thursday, September 3rd, 2014, which is around 20 miles north of the town of Billings in Montana. So Aaron was bow hunting, you know, he had a handgun in his backpack, the other two men were armed with rifles, so they were intending to stay near Campfire Lake. Uh, The group hiked up to the camp with two horses and a mule. Aaron had walked in. Yeah, exactly, and at some point during uh, the group's trip up to Campfire Lake, uh, their mule spooked, started bucking, and it threw the supplies it was carrying off the trail. Part of those supplies were actually was Aaron's sleeping bag. So, and to what I kind of you know thought was a little interesting about this is like I mean I wasn't able to find anything, but you know I mean maybe you were. Uh, but what spooked this mule? I don't. I wasn't able to find much more information, but I mean this is the wilderness, so it might have been a, a snake, some sort of animal. Uh, it's all speculation at this point, but it did uh, throw off their supplies. Unfortunately, Aaron's sleeping bag, and I think ultimately is what led to Aaron's ultimate disappearance. Okay, yeah, it, it's just it's very interesting. I mean, somebody who you know who is a seasoned hunter and everything, um, you know, just the mule gets spooked, throws off his supplies. You know, the guy's like, oh, crap, you know, I need that. You know, Mm -hmm. so what do I do from here? Um, But apparently on the morning of September 5th, Aaron, you know, to kind of answer that question, Aaron had decided to head up towards Sunlight Lake to try and replace his lost sleeping bag. And the reason being was that the group actually had a hunting camp at this location uh, that they had gotten the, the previous year. And they left a cache, which actually included a spare sleeping bag. So Aaron had originally planned on spending the night at Sunlight Lake. So his friends had told him that he needed to come back into camp as the area is is isolated and very dangerous at night. So he explained to them, he's like, I'm just going in there. I'm going to grab the supplies and return to the, you know, to you guys, you know, in the evening, you know, yeah. no, so no harm, no foul. Didn't think much of it. Yeah. The, the, his friends didn't think much of it. He was, he knew the area. Like he said, you know, they've, they hunted at this camp the year prior. So he knew how to get up there. So I believe Aaron went up there and later that afternoon, his friends at around 4 PM, they tried to get in touch with Aaron via, via their walkie talkies. And these walkie-talkies were uh, Garmin walkie-talkies, and these this equipment actually showed their perspective locations on the screen. What was weird about that is that Aaron's position was on the very edge of the screen, indicating that it looked like he missed the fork in the trail going up to Sunlight Lake, and he was instead heading walking northeast off trail. Which is which is very obscure for me. I mean, because as somebody who seemingly knows the area quite well, um, you know, why would he walk? off trail right 
and at this point there was no communication so all the only information his friends have to go with it is that he went off trail and they weren't able to get in touch with him so maybe if i'm his friend you know if we're hunting up there maybe he saw some game and he went after it Uh, that's my speculation when it comes to that situation yeah but i mean you know just kind of thinking you know playing devil's advocate here i mean even if i'm a hunter you know and i see some you know some sort of game you know, am I really going to follow that off the trail? You know, when I don't have I don't have a sleeping bag, I have I mean, virtually no means of, of staying alive. You know, without a sleeping bag or you know anything to keep me, you know, warm. Essentially, you know, especially yeah. if, if we're not staying in a camp. You know, yes, there's going to be a campfire. You know, there's going to be you know a, you know whatever. But I don't have a sleeping bag, so I mean, for me to veer off off trail here and you know go chase after some game when i don't have any sort of means to keep myself alive that just seems very strange to me yeah it seems like this was the point where they kind of realized uh something unusual but you know not enough to to kind of call the authorities and and go crazy Mm -hmm. I'm, i'm thinking at this point his friends just thought uh you know he saw something maybe some game he wanted to get it being bearing in mind that he had communication he had his bow he had a handgun so there really wasn't a reason to be concerned at this point no and, and honestly like, I, like up until like this point like it doesn't really seem that weird you know but right the, i mean the, really the only weird you know, like part about this is that he veered off the trail you know went to another trail something to that kind of nature but even then like that's still not like unexplainable Right, but then, the you know, they, they realized he went off trail. They weren't able to get in touch with him, but his friends didn't freak out too much. The next day, on September 6th, you know, his friends, okay, realized Aaron's definitely missing. He, he failed to return to the camp that night. He wasn't there in the morning. But, you know, at this point, they're kind of, they're holding on to hope that, you know, he killed something and he's on his way to drag it back. Mm-hmm. They're not super concerned at this point still, but... This is a. They waited a whole day on September sixth, and on September seventh, a snowstorm came in with eighteen to twenty-four inches of snow, and the temperature fell dramatically from forty to fifty degrees to ten to fifteen degrees Jesus. Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, again, too. I mean, just to kind of go on the notion that I was saying earlier, you know, this guy like doesn't have any sort of means to you know keep himself you know warm. Yeah, I mean, at least not unless, a sleeping bag. Yeah, no, I mean, in regards to a sleeping bag, right. So, you know, I mean, I've been camping before in, you know, 23 degree weather, and it's fucking cold. Like, it, it's it's yeah. not it's not anything to, to joke about. I mean, like, that's, that's, it's freezing. Yeah, exactly. And I think at this point, his friends uh, believe he made it up to camp, grabbed his sleeping bag, and stayed up there. But at this point, it's two days after Aaron left, and a snowstorm came in. Ultimately, you know, they decided to get in touch with his wife and and let her know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Because they called his wife on the 7th, Christine, and she actually didn't call the sheriff's office until the very next day on September 8th. Yeah, which is a little weird, um, but I mean, like honestly speaking, you know, from from that perspective, I mean, you know, you know, you know that your husband is a seasoned hunter, like you know that he's got experience doing this kind of stuff. So I mean, maybe it's not that strange. Yeah. But also at the same time, too, you know, the Garmin Walkie Talkie, you know, you can physically see his location. You know, so for me why wasn't that used you know why wasn't that utilized a bit more like why wasn't why why didn't they pull up the garmin walkie talkie and be like oh yeah hey he's right here you know hasn't moved or you know maybe he hasn't moved for five hours you know then obviously like something's wrong yeah i believe he went into like in the wilderness he went to he uh they weren't able to gather much more information from his location the day prior so I'm not exactly sure if his location was uh, available at this point, but mm. still, you know, missing persons cases, they're, the first 24 hours are imperative to, to find yeah. him. And at this point, Aaron himself was not reported missing until three days until the last time he spoke to anybody. Right, Which, right. It's unusual, but like I said, I will, I'll play devil's advocate and chalk it up to they were really confident in his, in his abilities and the gear he carried out there. Maybe that's why they waited so long. Well, and that's actually how they justified their decision, you know, by saying that, that they had actually, you know, looked for him uh, and that he was also armed and an experienced woodsman. So like, he, like, he, knew, like, the, he knew that area. He was an experienced hunter, very seasoned, you know, knew what he was kind of doing out there. And that's kind of how they justified, you know, obviously waiting so long, you know, to say, hey, 
we think something happened. Right. And this was a... Uh... This was unusual for authorities as a corporal greg todd who headed up the park county search and rescue he was kind of unable to draw any conclusions at the time because and i quote to me that just seems too long to report somebody missing i can understand if your buddy's missing you can go out and look for him for a day but after that you need to get some help i might have waited a day he might have killed something and it might have taken some time to get back up to camp so i'll go look for him the, the next day see if he needs help getting stuff out but if you can't find him by the end of the day, you know, you need like you need to get the hell out of there and ask for help. So we can't really uh, speculate on the second guess. You know, the corporal said that people react differently to these situations, but we really can't understand the thought process of his friends. But I'm thinking it was overconfidence in his abilities. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, th- that's definitely something that can be taken into you know consideration. You know, uh, the overconfidence, you know, in the ability of of the said person but at the same time too it's like you know kind of like he said you know you go out looking you know for for a day you don't find him next day you're ass out of there i mean going to get help yeah and that's how i believe most people would treat that situation but i mean like i said they were confident in his abilities and his gear and you could also blame the remoteness of the area and the lack of cellular phone coverage they just thought you know the, the circumstances didn't line up for him to get back in time but they were yeah. fully expecting him to come back down right well and then at that time you know or, or at, at that moment in time you know the official search has started the bad weather which hit the area on september 7th actually hindered the efforts to find Darren. yeah um so the continuing storm made air searching basically impossible for the first couple of days, and horseback riders were actually initially sent out before others joined. Uh, so the search and rescue teams, you know, focused their efforts on the area that stretched from the Cottonwood Lake Trail to Trespass Creek. Uh, in that, they had 20 dog teams, 7 horse teams, 59 ground searchers, and National Guard and private helicopters equipped with night vision equipment and spotlights eventually joined the effort. Yeah, so they brought out a large uh, search and rescue unit to, to try to locate Aaron. I, it's massive. Like that, That's not just yeah. large, that's massive. I mean, mm-hmm. that to me, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of area to cover. So, I mean, I, I can definitely understand, you know, obviously bringing in, you know, a lot of this, a lot of these resources and everything. Um, but it's, it's just, it's crazy. And, it, you know, especially yeah. with that storm rolling into, like, that makes it extremely difficult for, you know, for, you know, horseback riders to go in there and, and really try to navigate it. And especially trying to fly a, a helicopter. Yeah. And when, you know, being that the storm was out there and the crazy mountains in Montana, you know, they're, they've got steep cliffs, really dense uh, woods. And on top of the falling snow, it just, it makes the situation really difficult to try to find anybody out here. Sure. Well, and it, it's unforgiving, you know. Uh, yeah. Like, most importantly. Mm-hmm. But six days after he goes missing, Aaron's boots were found. So this is yeah. a Wednesday. So the second day of the search... Uh, east of Sunlight Lake, close to the creek in the falls, uh, they find the boots. Yeah, and that's curious because when we talk a lot about a lot of these cases, shoes te- seem to play a part in a lot of these uh, missing persons uh, cases. It's 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 usually a common you know common factor you know in most of these cases, mm-hmm. but in this particular case, they actually appear to be set intentionally side by side. Which yeah. to me again is very strange. I mean, look at right. look at the Adadero case we covered in our first episode. You know, shoes were you know essentially in in the same kind of order, right? Why? Yeah. You know, well, completely different circumstances. My speculation is because you know they found the boots and close by close by was a Camelback water bladder, and just off the trail was a fire pit with a partially burnt cigarette pack. A fire bundle, two waist belts from a backpack, which had been cut off, but were also located. But despite an extensive search, nothing else was found. And the two connected to the bladder had been removed, causing searchers to believe that Aaron had tried to drink water. Uh, I'm thinking at this point, maybe uh, Aaron was stuck in the snowstorm and maybe potentially his socks and boots got wet and he made a fire and he was trying to warm himself and dry off his boots. That's why I think potentially why he took off his boots, but it doesn't explain why he didn't put them back on. But, you know, keeping in mind that that no trace of him is found 
at this area you know right. it's just his boots and some some of his gear so it, it would tell you that aaron kept walking without his boots well and and i just want to touch on real quick too like those details that we literally just said just kind of go to you know to explain how experienced he is you know as as a quote-unquote woodsman i mean yeah. you know so you've got a fire pit you know you've got you know like the camelback you know the um everything that he had with him was for survival means yeah you know so obviously minus a sleeping bag but this guy knew how to how to how to survive in these conditions you know without having the sleeping bag yeah, and it looked like he, he set up camp here to try and warm up. That's my speculation for why he removed the boots. But uh, puzzlingly, you know, the searchers were in that same spot a day or two before, but they didn't come across any of this item. So it would tell you that Aaron was still alive and nearby when they were already searching this area the day before. Yeah, well, and that's just very weird. I mean, just because like the, like the items just miraculously appeared, you know, one or two days later for you know these other searchers and it's just like all right well we actually combed this area you know I, less than a day ago so, yeah and we've seen that in some of these cases it's kind of apparent it's a little bizarre so my two cents on that is was uh aaron circling around the area and they just happened to miss miss him because you know keeping in mind there a blanket of snow and a storm was covering this area so Granted, very difficult to find anybody, but just the fact that he was in an area that was already previously searched, you know, it makes you wonder. Yeah, and, and just the fact that, you know, obviously he did remove his boots, I mean, that, that is considerably strange, you know, but even if hypothermia had set in, you know, which, which caused him to remove clothing uh, and, and his footwear, he'd only have gotten a short distance, you know, without those boots, you know, because in, in two feet of snow, I mean, that's just gonna, that's gonna annihilate yeah. your feet. I mean, yeah. it's... It, it, you're not only gonna get cold, but you're like that hypothermia is gonna set in. Yeah, and you're gonna get frostbite. I mean, typically people don't strip layers when they're cold, but there's this thing called uh, paradoxical undressing. Quote me if I'm like wrong on that one, mm -hmm. but uh, people apparently they become in a state of delusion when they become hypothermic and start stripping layers off. That's the only reason I would see Aaron removing his boots because why else would you take your boots off? And continue walking in, in two feet of snow you know right it, it doesn't make any sense yeah and that doesn't make any sense to me either but you know again i've never been in that situation before where i've had to you know essentially take off article of clothing because of hypothermia um yeah. and don't expect myself to be in that kind of situation but you know it, it is kind of strange to think of it like that you know it, it is it is a very you know it, it is a paradox yeah I man you know he took off his boots and inter interestingly enough as we've seen in prior cases the sniffer dogs in the area weren't able to pick up a scent on on Aaron at all which i'm finding you know, with, with with as we're doing more and more of these cases i mean like this is becoming more and more of a common you know occurrence yeah but uh despite finding you know all that evidence that we just mentioned you know this, uh, september 22nd so 19 days after he goes missing officials actually decided to scale back the search until they received more information regarding this case yeah and at this point the kind of the trail went cold there there was no more to be found of Aaron. so you know they, they scaled it back they just chalked it up to he disappeared somehow or another something happened but they weren't able to find uh, any any more of him yeah well what what's interesting about this is that the following summer june 22nd 2015 um around nine months after the, the disappearance roger bislanowicz he was a butcher from powell wyoming actually came across Hedge's belongings while visiting relatives. So right. Bezlanowicz had to wait a while uh, whilst the relative was getting his fence fixed and everything like that. So it was some time to kill. He was looking around, you know, beautiful view, decided to go on top of a ridge. So yeah. after taking in the vista, uh, Bezlanowicz took a shortcut through a stand of timber and he saw an orange hunting vest as well as a backpack and clothing. Yeah, and as I recall, Bazlanowicz, he was from out of town. He went to go visit a, a friend at his ranch in Sweetgrass County. And yep. yeah, so he's not from the area. He wanted to get a better view, and he went up to the ridge. And ultimately, he went down. Uh, he took a shortcut through the stand of timber. Oh, finding the orange hunting vest, yep. a backpack, and clothing. You know, and at the scene, 
you could he found there was a bow obviously the backpack socks shirts sweatpants and the vest the backpack had holes in it which i mean authorities assumed were caused by small animals rappers from granola bars around along with other debris were scattered nearby aaron's gun and driving license were also in the pack so obviously that narrows it down to aaron was at this point right. within walking distance from ranch yeah and and what's an interesting you know kind of tidbit for for me personally is that where this pack was found he would have been able to see the house from there so he would have been able to see that ranch yeah so why you know why didn't he go to the ranch yeah if or he was did in he? trouble yeah well, if he was in trouble why wouldn't he you know get help is at this point he would have been missing for a while and i'm uh, we're left to speculate why he didn't if he was even at a uh, in a mental state to even recognize that he was a short distance away from from being saved i, I don't know yeah so that area was searched uh after he found the belongings Strangely, at the head of the ridge, there was a thermos cup and an open energy drink. So obviously, yeah. like, so he was here, and obviously, yeah. like, like, there's actual evidence here to to speculate that you know Aaron had been here at one point or another. Yeah, he would have been alive within walking distance from this civilization, from this ranch. Right. So August eighth. Now this is 2016. Yeah. Near the ranch. Some guests that were staying there actually found a skull underneath a dead tree. Yeah. Crazy. So law enforcement was shown the skeletal remains of the skull, then began a systematic search of the area where they actually uncovered less than 80% of Hedge's skeleton, all within about 50 to 70 yards of the ranch. Yeah. The majority of the remains were concentrated in a 20-yard area. The spread of the remains was not atypical according to the sheriff, and I quote, you have to consider that he has possibly been there over a year. Within that year, you have weather events, predation, scavenging, everything from ants to bears, end quote. So that was still an ongoing you know, investigation, but they really couldn't tell, you know, what the man had died from. Yeah, the and, cause of death was, uh, they were, it's undetermined, you know, there was no bullet holes in the skull nothing else to go on you know no more information no knife wounds no hatchet marks no i mean obviously at this point his body was mostly uh withered and disintegrated so mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to tell what actually happened to aaron that well, and, and again to, to go to go back to you know to, to what the sheriff was saying i mean you know there are so many different factors that that could have you know that just could have happened. I mean, you know, you've got the predation, you've got, you know, scavenging, you know, weather events. I mean, that's all of that's going to, you know, have an effect on, you know, what this skeletal remain looks like, you know, yeah, and, and obviously where it is too. No, that's true. I mean, it's, it just came down and, you know, the sheriff said it, it's, it's going to go down as one of those mysteries if they don't find any more information on it. Mm -hmm. Well, the investigators actually found a cell phone. Um, it was a Samsung right. cell phone that uh, he had near his body. So they were initially hopeful to recover any sort of information or data from it, but it actually ended up being corroded beyond repair. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, it, think about that. It was exposed to the elements for almost two years. It, yeah, know, exactly. Multiple chemical baths to, you know, to, to remove the corrosion, but they all failed. I mean, because, again, two years out in the, weather, in the wilderness, I mean, I don't really know, you know, really any item that's got or, you know electronic i should say that's going to be salvageable at that point you know to to the effect of it's going to be working again yeah and it's unfortunate they weren't able to get more information but i mean in the perfect circumstances it'd be hard to get anything out of that phone after so long right well and that, that's what i mean too i mean you know you, you take any electronic device and you put it outside for you know nearly two years i mean and try to get you know try to get it to work again good luck yeah and after that you know there was no more uh evidence to go on you know so you you try to summarize like you try to wrap your head around all the data and all the facts in this case so if if the hunting party began their trip from conwood lake trailhead on the west side of the mountains and hedges you know aaron was heading north to sunlight lake how the hell did he end up on the east side of the range? You know, the distance he would have had to walk to be to get there would have been around 13, 15 miles. 
Much of it would have been off trail through tough terrain, including rocks and heavy foliage. And this is all without boots, mind you. Yeah. Yeah, the vast majority is without boots. Not to mention the big storm had battered the area. So the, deci- the decision to travel east uh, along that, that trail, it would have presented a considerable challenge for even the most experienced outdoorsman. Well, and again, I want to go back to that too. I mean, he had no boots on. So yeah. that, that's that's for, you know, that'd be a challenge for an experienced outdoorsman with boots. Yeah. But this guy made, you know, a trek 13 to 15 miles, you know, off trail tough terrain you know rocks and heavy foliage and dense you know bushes and everything like that without boots on like yeah so this kind of baffled uh search and rescue you know they would wonder how can a man without boots walk in in snow on his bare feet you know as the crow flies is around 13 miles Mm -hmm. from where he was to the point where it was found and you can pretty much double that distance in reality due to the harshness of the terrain it's not right. like, you know, you can't walk a straight shot in the wilderness with, with all the ridges and changes in elevation and the rocks. Yeah, and, and so another point I want to make, too, is that, you know, uh, going back to where his remains were found. So Aaron was within sight of buildings and close to a road. You know, why, you know, he, he was so close. Why, you know, why didn't he get there? You know, you know, what happened? Well, I mean... That's another thing. Like it's, we just don't know, so it just leaves room for speculation. Uh, Aaron and his friends were known to uh, trespass in the past. They've been known for poaching. So, what I'm thinking is maybe Aaron was afraid that he was gonna get hit with uh, trespassing or something along those lines, and he didn't want to risk it. But at the point that you know that he gets to this area, he's traveled so far without boots. You know, it would make you wonder, like, he wouldn't care about getting caught on some silly uh, trespassing charge when his life is in jeopardy. Yeah, and I mean, I've got to really question that just because, I mean, human nature, I mean, if if you're if you're in a situation where it's literally life or death and, you know, and and you have no boots on, you're you're I mean, I I, I can't imagine he didn't have frostbite. I mean, walking, you know, as, as far as he did, you know, without boots on. Yeah, he you know, must have had frostbite and some sort of hypothermia, which, right. I mean, that would have to explain the the removal of the boots, I'm guessing. Or, as I said earlier, maybe his socks and boots were wet. He took them off to dry them. But why wouldn't he put them back on? Well, it, it, right. But even further into that notion, though, you know, it, it, it would be human nature, you know, to want to live, to, to want to do whatever it takes to survive. So even if he is going to get caught for trespassing or, you know, poaching or whatever take it i yeah. mean you know w- whatever whatever the, you know the charges for that like take it like at least she'll be alive you know here you're dead like yeah, i'm that sorry one doesn't but seem uh to make a lot of sense to me it doesn't and add I, up to me no and i try to like i try to put myself in, in Aaron's shoes and the situation he was in i don't i don't see myself doing that and you know you try to look online and try to find sources that try to give you uh more of an answer to what really happened but i mean i've seen theories that you no know, ranchers out here you know maybe he trespassed on somebody's land and uh they had something to do with aaron's disappearance and i've seen this theory a couple times but my problem with that is if you know if there is foul play involved here you know why would they go to the lengths of placing his remains and his gear in these particular areas like that it just that theory just doesn't really add up to me yeah but you know i also want to touch back to uh the forensics though because you know I mean, to my knowledge, I mean, I wasn't able to find anything on here that said or that that led to any sort of notion that, you know, there there were knife marks on the bones or anything to that kind of matter to, you know, to really indicate foul play. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, from the point that he took his boots off, you know, one can speculate, well, maybe he was grabbed by a bear at this point. But the fact that his remains and, you know, not only his remains were found so far away, the fact that his backpack and his bow, because if Aaron was really in dire straits and you know why wouldn't he just drop his bow it's unnecessary weight Mm -hmm. if he's really hypothermic why would he carry his bow this whole time right and one and and all of all of his other gear as well and and why why would he have an energy drink that's just kind of sitting there on you know that that was sitting there opened up and you know yeah so it kind of tells you that aaron at this point you know had had sit down and taken like a breather he he took the cap off the thermos he he poured a liquid into there he placed his backpack on that tree stump so 
some I don't know it just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me if he's really in this situation that he would carry all this gear and go and go ahead and place his backpack and his bow down it's 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 kind of bizarre yeah no it, it's it's definitely one of the one of the stranger cases that we've looked into I mean you know one being that you know that we that there were actually remains found you know obviously for Aaron um mm-hmm. but two you know they actually found you know articles of clothing gear you know etc cetera, etc cetera, you know but they still have no idea you know what happened to this guy yeah and Aaron you know that being said he was he was well geared he had uh, the GPS tracker on his walkie talkie which he enabled, never reached out to his friends during this point so what happened from the point that he was walking on the trail to the point he started walking east towards who knows where you know off trail because remember at the point that uh, his friends noticed he was walking off trail the atmospheric event that storm hadn't rolled through so what actually you know made Aaron or what in his mind why did he decide to go off trail if he even did you know, I just, right. I don't know. yeah a lot, lot of questions on this one a lot of questions yeah I mean it's just it's a bizarre case and it's testament to the crazy mountains of Montana man and I've I've actually seen a good amount of cases up here. Maybe we'll cover in the future. Okay. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, you know, I mean, the name, the Crazy Mountains, I mean, I guess a lot can happen there. A lot has happened. Yeah, no doubt about it. So next on the list for today's episode, we have Ray Salmon, which this one happened outside of Vancouver. Yeah, and before we get into this one, like, with our research, trying to find more information on this, uh, this case is actually featured in David Politis' uh, latest book, Can-Am, uh, you know, for Missing 411, the Canada edition. And he covers a whole range of uh, missing persons cases up there that fit the Missing 401 criteria. And I found this information on an interview that he did recently promoting his book. And there's not a whole lot of info to go on, just based on what uh, Dave Politis uh, said in the interview. But I thought it was an interesting enough case to, for us to kind of bring on here and try to break it down because Vancouver, Canada, apparently has the second largest cluster of missing persons in North America. Yeah, and, and that's a really interesting fact, uh, you know, just because of the fact, I mean, you know, I just kind of wonder how, like, how much that's been researched, like, you know, as far as that is concerned, because I know that the United States gets a lot of, uh, or has gotten a lot of attention as far as like David Politis is concerned. Um, you know, but how much attention has you know Canada been you know been paid attention right. to because when of the vast the size, amount of wilderness there? Yeah, exactly. When you look at the size of Canada and the population density, you know, you can go miles upon miles without seeing anybody. You know, it's it's wild country up there. It for is the most part because this was just outside of Vancouver. The funny thing is that you know you drive uh, thirty minutes, an hour outside of Vancouver, it starts to get pretty uh, pretty wild out there you know isolated there's not a whole lot going on outside the major cities right right well and and outside the major cities i mean you have you know small little townships and everything like that but nothing i mean nothing extravagant you know right Mm -hmm. so this guy you know he goes out you know he went out with his dog set up in a campground area um very remote and isolated and again you know getting back to the whole you know it's wild up here yeah ray had actually planned to be there for about a week you know, he had always taken his dogs as a safety precaution. Yeah, because keeping in mind, yeah, this is Canada, the wilderness. You've got all sorts of large game out here. So the fact that Ray always took his dogs with him, uh, you know, tells you what he he potentially could expect out there. You know, he was prepared. That's why he always brought his dogs with him. Yeah, and, and also, I, I don't know if I blame him. Um, you know, dogs are... A great deterrent, you know, whether it be for, you know, for an animal or for even, I mean, even humans, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I mean, I've got, a, I've got a dog myself and, you know, anytime somebody ever, you know, knocks on the door or, you know, is she hears somebody outside, she barks and she alerts me and, and that's how I know, hey, somebody's outside my door, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great, you know, like I said, deterrent. Yeah, no doubt about it. And, you know, it's apparently he's done this before because he told his wife he was going to be up there for a week. He took his dogs. But apparently on the third night that he was there uh, on the camp- campground nearby, people reported hearing gunfire. 
so i mean strange but you know maybe not super strange but it's pretty isolated so the people actually they they called it into authorities they they called in the rcmp which is uh i had to look this up the rcmp is the royal canadian mounted police right to investigate yeah, oddly enough, well, or unoddly enough, they arrive on the scene, they don't find or see Ray. You know, his yeah. dogs are inside the camper, and after searching the area, they actually find a pile of clothing that's right near the lake. Yeah. So, the lake is located a couple hundred yards from his camper. Obviously, it's odd, because it's it's cold. I mean, it's, it's real cold out. Yeah, so, thinking, thinking about that fact, so... His dogs are in the camper, and there's clothes, a pile of clothing in the lake. Why would uh, a why would Ray leave his dogs inside his camper if he was planning on stepping away? Right. And why would he strip down and take? What, did he take a dip in the lake? You know, it's it's freezing cold. Uh, that that part didn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. And that that just that just tells me. I mean, I mean, you, you enter that lake. I mean, you've got a couple like minutes before you get hypothermia. Yeah. So nothing would like nothing would tell me that he would go in the lake to strip down go in the lake and take a swim that just that, just, that makes no sense right yeah and, and I mean at this point of the game there's still zero signs of Ray um, the next day the RCMP personnel arrive begin searching further Ray's wife Danielle had actually contacted Dave Politis and told him that the RCMP had shown up with a SWAT team and they went into the woods so now Danny, I don't know about you, but I mean, have you ever heard of a missing person in the woods? You know, they call in the SWAT team. No, the only reason, uh, the only info I found on that is if if there's a criminal in the woods that's trying to elude uh, apprehension, that is the only reason I found why uh, authorities would bring a SWAT team out to to look for somebody. Well, and that would make so, sense, but I, but I feel like at this point of the game, I mean, I mean, unless he's just. I mean, maybe he just didn't check or didn't hear about it on the news or whatever. But you know, I feel like you would know if there was like a you know a dangerous person you know out in these woods if yeah, he, if he did escape. Right, but you know, at this point they they bring SWAT out, so they obviously mm. think something dangerous is lurking out here. A person, an animal, I don't know, but you know, they bring out the SWAT, but. Danielle's uh, Danielle, who is uh, Ray's wife, she's kind of kept kept out of the loop during this whole investigation, which is weird. You know why? You know, it's the man's wife. He's obviously missing. Why? Why wouldn't you disclose more information for her? Well, right, and they really kept her, you know, at arm's length, you know, with this whole investigation. Mm -hmm. um, so after three days of searching, they actually tell his wife that they think he's in the lake. So. At, at this point of the game, I mean, I kind of wonder, you know, what makes you say he's in the lake? You know, I mean, aside yeah. from the you know, the clothing being found right next to it, yes, that's odd. Yes, that would, you know, I mean, logically point to maybe he is in the lake, but why? All right, and if, I, I get it that you might think he's in the lake, but so what led you to bring a SWAT team up to the wilderness and try to look for this person? You know, why would you bring another a valid point? specialty team to go in there and find somebody you know did you suspect foul play of some reason and why aren't you telling the guy's wife uh the information on this yeah well and and it's it's just it's very unexplainable you know most most of this so far yeah it's un unusual to say the least but you know they like you said they after three days they tell his wife that they believe he's in the lake so Ray's wife, Danielle, she hires a team with sonar capability to scan the lake for Ray's remains because obviously he hasn't been found at this point. If they think he's in the lake, he's going to be at the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. So the sonar team comes out. They scan the lake. They pull this uh, sonar behind them on their boat. They scan the lake for three days. And the team guaranteed her that Ray's body was not in that lake. Yeah, and I mean, if, if it's not like a like a vast you know gigantic lake i mean we've got the technology nowadays you know to be able to do that you know to, to be able to do that sort of thing you know to to comb a lake like that you know our technology is, is incredible these days you know for for them to come back and say nope he's definitely not in there you know right that's very strange for me just because of the fact you know this swat team was like oh yeah he's probably in there like who knows and just yeah. kind of like brushed her off no, it, it definitely didn't make any sense, but 
you know that's kind of where we're left at so summarizing everything up you know all the facts you know a ray never left the truck without his dogs you know because they provided safety against large predators that was his deterrent the the pile of clothes next to the lake uh, that part right there that kind of stuck out to me that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me why would he strip down you know was there foul play involved here because if he was you know people say paradoxical undressing because of hypothermia but he was within short walking distance from his camper so well, right and he had you know protection from the elements so yeah you know why would he take off his clothes at the lake yeah, that, that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And why did the RCMP feel the need to bring an armed SWAT team out during their search and rescue efforts? Uh, I, I don't know, man. That, that's weird. But, you know, since uh, Ray's wife contacted David Politis, you know, they both filed a, a, freedom, a, a FOA request, the Freedom of Information Act request against mm-hmm. the RCMP. And to, and the government, they, they filed against RCMP and the government to get a copy of all the reports, or, uh, reports pertaining to the case. They got one report, Gary, which was three pages long, and it was 95% redacted. Yeah, and see, like, that to me just there's screams that, that there's something that they know that they don't want us to know. Yeah, they told his wife that they can't release information of, of the, of the, on that case. So what is it, a sensitive criminal investigation? Is there something they don't want the public to know? But that's all that's all the information we're left with on that case i mean that that's that's what i would that, that that's what i would be led to think i mean that that there's something that they know that they don't want the public eye to figure out or to know so i, I mean at, at this point of the game you know did you know was it some sort of predation case where you know where he was just dragged off somewhere you know never well, found my again? Thing, right my thing is if it was a predation case let's say a bear grabbed ray and dragged him into the woods okay that's unfortunate but if if that would have happened what's keeping you from telling the guy's wife about it why are you holding so much information about this people know bears are dangerous so why are you withholding all this information on it that i don't know well not to mention the fact i mean you know clothing by the lake what's what's the bear walking up to him being like yo let's take your clothes so i can drag into the woods and eat you exactly so like all the facts in the case that they don't mesh well so is it foul play i don't know but there's just not a whole lot of information to go on but it's definitely it's a bizarre one to say the least huh? yeah th- this is definitely a strange a very 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 strange case i mean just because of the fact i mean that there are so very little details you know that that kind of play into this into this uh case that we're we're looking into but you know it, it's it's one of those where that just kind of makes you scratch your head and it's kind of just yeah. like what the hell you know yeah definitely it's it's a weird one and like if if you want to get more information on this uh you know this is i believe this book dropped in november september something like that uh, missing 411 canada and he dave covers a lot of these clusters in in canada and i'm sure there's more information there but as of right now that that's all the info we're left with at this point yeah and i'd actually i'd like to try to get a copy of uh of that report um yeah so if, if we are able to actually get a copy of that, we'll actually post that um, on our social media and just kind of give you guys kind of a heads up, you know, as, as far as where we, where you can find it. Because um, I am actually very interested to see that. But, I mean, if it's yeah. 95% redacted, I mean, that, that's – you're basically looking at something that's got, you know, hole after hole after hole after hole. Exactly. So, I mean, we'll – Anybody, ourselves and anybody is free to file a, a Freedom of Information Act on – on this particular case but like i said there's not a whole lot to go on but i would love to find out more information on this it's it's definitely intriguing yeah no to say the least but that's what we have for today um so you know just kind of going back to it you know if, if you guys have any sort of cases that you want us to look into or you know any any like unexplained events that you that you have or that have happened to you or you know whatever um you know please feel free to reach out to us the wildly unexplained at gmail.com Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we've got plenty of social media. Yeah, and uh, our YouTube page is dropped. You know, we're we're planning on putting all our episodes on there. If you're interested in that, in the future, we we'd like to stream our episodes so you guys can can watch along with us. Yeah, and, and we're we are building a Discord community. Um, you know, access through that is going to be through our Patreon. So, you know, if you are, you know, if you do feel inclined to support our podcast and kind of support our future, you know, episodes that we do create. Um, you know, please support us, please, you know, spread the news, kind of, you know, pass us around to, to whoever you think would be interested in us. Yeah. Um, 
you know, but we'd love to kind of hear from you guys. So, you know, again, yeah. you know, reach out to us on social media, email us, you know, any, any sort of content that you feel is very unexplained or, you know, just kind of mysterious. Right. And, you know, be sure to like, subscribe, uh, wherever you stream your podcast from. Also, uh, write a review. Those help tremendously. I know uh, if, if, if you feel inclined to and you like the episode, definitely let us know. Let other people know that, that you like this episode. It'll help us a lot to, to keep all these episodes going. Yeah, for sure. Well, great, uh, great talking about this, Danny. But uh, for now, signing off. See you later, brother. <laughs>